Hey everybody, welcome on back. It's the Twisted History Podcast. Twisted History this week and next week. We're going to do, I know I, I say this is going to be a part one, will be a part two somewhere down the line. And a lot of times when I say that, we never get to the part two. This week and next week is a two-part Twisted History, and it's all surrounding a song. It's surrounding the song by Billy Joel called We Didn't Start the Fire. We Didn't Start the Fire by Billy Joel. I asked a host of people in and around the Barstool office and at home and all this kind of bullshit if they've ever heard of the song before, and everybody has. So I don't think this is a dated, you know, uh, thing of mine oh large we don't know anything it's a song from 1989 so we're going to talk about this song because it makes a shitload of historical references and we're going to break every one of them down so we're going to do that this episode and next at next episode so buckle in this episode i am thrilled to say that saint anne is co-hosting with me vibs is doing the lower the lowering the bar um Olympics. He's doing that. So he's all tied up this week. And we didn't want to push it off to do it on um, on what you call it on Zoom again. Just don't like the way that they sound. So we're live in the studio. It's me, St. Anne to my immediate right. And as obvious, as always, we have a handsome John uh, behind the ones and twos, um, making everybody look better than they <laughs> than they really are. Uh, how are you doing, Ann? I'm great, thank you. All right, Can't so you, complain. So she just showed me something. There's a guy named Clayton Jasinski. Clayton Jasinski. I'm not sure if we're allowed to use his name, and it's not a regular, uh, you know, a pretty run-of-the-mill uh, name. But <laughs> that uh, was anyway, his suggestion. He, he wrote said, in. To could do you do a song, Twisted History? Great idea. Yeah, yeah. So he he sent in the thing. I I tell you what, I don't even like Billy Joel. I don't dislike him, but I don't necessarily like him. I've seen him live. Yeah, I had to drag you to that concert, kicking and screaming. You ended up having a blast. But you actually got a great blog out of it. Remember that? Right. I almost shit myself. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, we went to Zoom Stompdish. Wow, that was a long time ago. That was pre-2008, before the market turned over. So it's let's say it was like, I don't know, his last hurrah at Shea Stadium. It was supposed to be. And we yeah, had, uh, and so we went to Zoom Stomptish first for a German <laughs> meal with a bunch of friends. We went right to Billy Joel, and then I was just about to uh, mud myself, and so I got up and I missed the first three songs, um, taking a dump in, in Shea Sta- the old Shea Stadium. That with, might have been one of your first Take a Report blogs. You yeah, know, it was in the middle. A lot of people consider that one of their favorite blogs. I should try to dig that one up. Take a Report is a website that <laughs> I did before I started here at Barstool, and I did it before there was a cloud. So you can't find any of my old take a report writings anywhere. We have some of them printed out, but I'm not going to transcribe them or do anything like that. But one of them was, I forget what the hell the title was. But anyway, I was at the Billy Joel concert. I have it, I'll find it. Yeah, so the Billy Joel concert that we went to is very good. I'll tell the story of why it infuriated me at the beginning of the next podcast, just to keep some continuity. (laughs) But we didn't start the fire. I don't even know where it is in his list of hits. But it seems like it's pretty recognizable. Like right away, Big Ab is like, I know it. Jordan um, from Mean Girls podcast was like, oh, shoot, I know that song. Kate, I know it. Obviously, Brandon Walker knows it. Robbie's like, I know. Pat knows it. It's older than most of them, too. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's one of those things where for some reason, everyone's like, yeah, it was big in high school. It was big in college because it's kind of a pretty cool little anthem song. And I remember when I was in college... There was a song uh, by R.E.M. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. And everybody tried to uh, m- memorize the words to it. So whenever it was played at a at a house party or whatever, Leonard Bernstein, like everyone knew like all, all these, these words from it. <laughs> and the same thing with this song. Mm-hmm. But I think even if people know all the words to uh, "We Didn't Start the Fire," I highly doubt that people know what those words mean, what they reference, or don't know enough about what they reference. Right. You know, so Begin, Reagan, Palestine, like, I don't know if people know who those people, I mean, they know who Reagan is, they know where Palestine is, maybe they don't know who Begin, like, you know, so what we're going to do is we're going to tear it apart. And I think it's going to be very good. I'm I'm actually excited to do this one, and I'm extremely excited to do with Annie. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's good. Alrighty. So it was released as a single on September 27th, 1989. Okay. So we didn't start the fire is 33 years old, almost 33 years old. And then it was later released as part of Joel's album Stormfront on October 17th, 
1989. Single first, and then put into the album Stormfront in 1989. I don't know how good of an album Stormfront was. I think he was wearing like sunglasses mm -hmm. and like a... Uh, it was a new look. Like he, he, he yeah. was stepping away from his old yeah. stuff. Like almost, almost like he was a gangster fisherman. I, 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 don't, I don't get Billy Joel. Either way, he's very, very talented. But <laughs> this is what's called a list song. We Didn't Start the Fire is a list song. It's a song based wholly or in part on a list of some kind. So unlike topical songs with a narrative and a cast of characters... List songs typically just develop by working through a series of information. Everybody knows a list song. Maybe they don't know they know it, but they will after I'm done. This list song in particular has fast-paced lyrics. I mean, he rolls through them. That include brief references to 118 significant political, cultural, scientific, or, and or sporting events between 1949, the year that Joel was born, and 1989, the year the song was released, and it's in mainly chronological order. So if you know all the words to We Didn't Start the Fire, you don't know what they mean, and you didn't know that they were in chronological order from his birthday until the time this song was released. It's a 40-year time capsule of American and world history. Here are some other list songs that you may or may not know. There was a song called "Bad Touch" by the Bloodhound Gang. I don't think many people know. I, I think I, I think <laughs> you, I think I think you'd be surprised. And it lists a shitload of euphemisms for sexual acts. And the original video contained a scene that had two gay guys who were sharing French fries in a very gay way, flamboyantly gay way. And the bandmates show up and they beat the guys with baguettes. And that was like a gay bashing scene, and it was cut almost immediately after it premiered. I remember seeing the original video, and even back then, I was like, yikes. But Bad Touch Bloodhound Gang is sort of one of those inappropriate, fun-type bands, and I like it. I like Bad Touch. It was, you know, you and me, baby, ain't nothing but right. mammals. <laughs> so it's a... By the way, I nailed that. Um, so Bad Touch, that was a list song, because he kept on listening just ways that you could bang. Another one is California Girls by the Beach Boys. Now East Coast girls and right. the Northern girls with, you know, the Midwest farmers. He's just he's just listing all these different girls. They are listing all these different girls. So California Girls by the Beach Boys is a list song. One of the most overt list songs is probably something no one's ever heard of. You have because you're married to me. But it's a song uh, called 88 Lines About 44 Women. That's a great song. Yeah. It's by a band called The yeah. Nails. And the lead singer of The Nails had, you know, had some sort of relationship with 44 women. So he gives them all two lines in the song. You know, Rena was a Catholic girl. She put out to the bitter end. Ronnie was much more my type. She's the one who put it in. Like, it's fun. You want to kind Rena of was a black to girl. It. I was afraid. Of, yeah. <laughs> and so it's 88 lines about 44 women by the nails. You should check it out. It's a classic list song. The 10 Crack Commandments. Never get high on your own <laughs> supply by Biggie Smalls. Definitely a list song. It's the end of the world as we know it. As I had mentioned, you know, seems like this stream of conscious thing that R.E.M. was just kind of doing, mm -hmm. like just throwing it out. But if you look even in that song, it's the end of the world as we know it. Maybe I'll, I'll dedicate a, a thing to that too. There are patterns. Like at one point during that song, there's a small section that's just dedicated to people with the initial L.B., right? Like so there's a quartet where it's Leonard Bernstein, Leonid Brezhnev, Lenny Bruce, and Lester Bangs, like all guys that just happen to be LB. There's all these little patterns within that REM list song. And perhaps the most popular list song in history is the 12 Days right. of Christmas. Don't forget about Vogue from Madonna. Yeah, so she goes through all those iconic, um, you know, sex symbols. And so, by the way, we have a couple of really cool iconic, I said iconic twice already, uh, sex know. symbols in this one. But um, the 12 Days of Christmas, mm -hmm. When Your True Love Gave to You, is uh, is probably one of the most popular list songs in history. All right, so those are list songs. And We Didn't Start the Fire, like I said, has a total of 118 political, cultural, scientific, and sporting events in the 40-year span between 1949 and 1989. 
and I'm going to sing every fucking last one of them. And I I'm will going not. To, and I'm going to explain every last one of them. You can because sing mine. That's what we do. Yeah, no, I'm going I'm to sing a lot. By the way, we can't get the rights to that, obviously. We can't get the rights to Billy Joel type stuff. So you won't be hearing it. But I, after you listen to this, please stick with this because I think it's pretty cool. And after you listen to this, listen to the song. And it, I don't know. I just listened to it on the way in, just to make sure I had some of the pronunciations right. And it's fucking fascinating. So let's get going, right? Are you good? Where are you going for fucking snacks? No, I'm. Well, right, you're on. You're no, on. You were looking that's, for a pen. That's a live mic. Ma- that's a live mic. Oh, sorry. All right. It sounds like there was mice in the fucking. <laughs> Your pen died. All right. All right. So <laughs> we, we didn't start the fire by Billy Joel, 1989. It starts off with Harry Truman, Doris Day, Red China, Johnny Ray, South Pacific, Walter Winchell, Joe DiMaggio. All right, so those I bet everybody the, would know everything but Walter Winchell. Yeah, um, I don't think everyone knows Johnny Ray, Harry Truman, Doris Day, Red China, Johnny Ray. I'll do those first, right? I'll do them all. South Pacific, Walter Winchell, Joe DiMaggio. So this is one of the only two stand- stanzas from the 1940s. I told you this starts in 1940s when Billy Joel was born. And more specifically, everything in that stanza that I just sang expertly <laughs> is from 1948, a couple of them like bled into 1948, and 1949, all right? And the reason I say 1948, because when you just say Harry Truman, you could be referring to Harry Truman in 1949, so I didn't lie. But I will tell you, Harry Truman won the 1948 United States presidential election following a partial term after the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a little bit of American history. That's how I'm going to start this off with just the first two words. Let's remember that for a sec, right? Henry Wallace had served as FDR's vice president for the previous four years during FDR's third term. But everyone knew that going into a fourth term, there were no term limits back then. Everyone knew going into a fourth term that FDR would, one, win the election, but two, probably not make it through. They knew that this guy couldn't be buying green bananas. He was on borrowed time. And people didn't like the idea of Henry Wallace as being the next person up. Because Wallace, even though he was a good vice president, he was viewed as being too far to the left and too friendly to labor for some of Roosevelt's advisors. So they opted instead for the senator from Missouri, Harry S. Truman. Here's another little tidbit you didn't know. Harry S. Truman, if you ever see it written and you see a period after the S, like you would for any middle initial, Mm -hmm. any middle initial that stands for something should have a period. Michael J. McCarthy, Anthony. Yeah, they should all have periods. (laughs) Harry S. Truman should not because Harry Truman's middle name is S. Mm -hmm. He has two grandparents, as most of us do, two grandfathers, I should say. Both of them had first names that started with S, And Truman's mom couldn't decide which grandfather to use as a middle name for her son. So she just opted for the letter S. So Mm -hmm. Harry S. Truman, the S stands for S. So it should never have a period behind it. He was a senator from Missouri, which, by the way, you can't call Missouri Mizzou. That's just about the college. (laughs) I learned that because I wrote a blog about it. And somebody's like, it's so idiotic to see Skidmore Mizzou. Mizzou (laughs) just means... I didn't think it was idiotic. I thought it was an honest mistake, but everybody can go fuck themselves, right? So Harry S. Truman, the senator from Missouri, is tabbed to be the vice president for FDR and FDR's fourth term. Truman had been vice president for only 82 days when he received an urgent message to go immediately to the White House where Eleanor Roosevelt, who we spoke about before, Mm -hmm. FDR's wife, told him that her husband had died after a massive cerebral hemorrhage. Truman asked her, Eleanor, is there anything I can do to help? And she replied, is there anything you can do to help? Is there anything I can do for you? You're the one in trouble now. You're president. (laughs) That's what she had said. She was awesome. Her quotes are the best. That was in 1945. (laughs) So then Harry Truman, S without a period, spent three years as president after FDR died. And then the mention in Billy Joel makes of him winning the 1948 election where he had to come from behind to beat Republican Thomas Dewey. And there's an iconic picture 
of Truman saying Dewey beats Truman. He's holding up the the newspapers were already printed saying that Dewey had beat him, but he came from behind. It's one of my favorite things to do. And um, and he won the election. That was in 1948. So he was president for three years. Then he uh, won his first real election barely in 1948. By the way, Ulysses S. Grant, the S stands for nothing also. Right. Okay. I didn't know that. There we go. So Truman, that's the first thing that, and I can obviously go into Truman for days, but I'm not going to. That's the first reference. If I spend that much time on all 114, 118 of these things, you guys are fucked. But I'm, I'm not going to. So Harry Truman, Doris Day. Doris Day, big musician and actress of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. She lived until she was 97, but in 1948, she debuted in the film Romance on the High Seas. Doris Day is not only mentioned in this song by Billy Joel, she's also mentioned in a Beatles song. She's mentioned in an Elton John song. And most importantly, she's mentioned in a song by Wham. Wham. Yeah. So that's Doris Day. She was a 40s, 50s, and 60s entertainment um, legend. So Harry Truman, Doris Day. Red China. Red China, very quickly, is the, it was established by the Communist Party of China, who wins the civil Chinese Civil War, which ended December 7th, 1949. So Red China is just Communist China after the Civil War ended in 1949. I told you everything in this first stanza is from 1948 and 1949. So what else do we have? Red China, Johnny Ray. Johnny Ray. And again, I don't think people know this because I don't know it. Johnny Ray is cited by critics as the father of rock and roll. Johnny Ray signed his first recording contract with OK Records in 1949. Johnny Ray was caught twice soliciting undercover cops posing as gay prostitutes in nightclubs. I don't mean to put that on him, but if you're going to remember anything, Johnny Ray, father of rock and roll, closeted homosexual. That's what comes up a lot with him. Even though he was married twice to uh, female entertainers, he was caught twice trying to uh, solicit gay prostitutes. That was Johnny Ray, right? Go ahead. Did you say something? No, I was wondering if, like that, in Mrs. Maisel, the guy that's in the show that um, Shy Baldwin, I wonder if he's made after Johnny Ray. Uh, probably. I, you know, I don't know. Now that I'm seeing it, I didn't, I didn't put the connection together, but I'm wondering. So if anybody knows the answer to that. Right. South Pacific, Walter Winchell, Joe DiMaggio. And I don't know why I put the emphasis on that syllable. So South Pacific was an award-winning Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. Stein. It opened Hammerstein. <laughs> it opened on Broadway in 1949. It won 10 Tony Awards. It became the second longest running Broadway musical up to that point behind Rodgers and Hammerstein's earlier work, Oklahoma. So South Pacific takes over from Oklahoma. No, it's, it's the second longest behind Oklahoma, but it opens in 1949. Billy's mentioning this because South Pacific was the cultural, it was out, it was their Hamilton. Yeah. Right? Like Big now, mm-hmm. I can't help while we're doing this, wanting to pick up the torch in 1989 and do from then on out. Well, he'll probably do it when he hits 80. He probably, he's probably working on it. It's his part two. It's his twisted history. Yeah, perhaps. Two. Because like I try to find parallels There's a lot on what of they have. So, like, the Truman thing would be, I mean, perhaps Trump. South Pacific is definitely our Hamilton. And then Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio. And the reason he puts him in here in 4849 is because on February 7th, 1949, the Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio. Was he a Yankee Clipper or was that? I don't know. I don't know enough baseball. Phil Rizzuto? Phil Rizzuto might have been there. Anyway. Joe D. Anyway, Joe DiMaggio on February 7th, 1949... He was 33 years old, and he signed a $100,000 contract. And that was huge, 1949, it made him the highest paid player in Major League history, right? So that's enough for me to mention Joe DiMaggio, but you know that's not all I'm going to mention for some reason. He is the Yankee Clipper. I have two stories about Joe DiMaggio, the Yankee Clipper. The first one about Joe D uh, involves his D, and I've told this story (laughs) before. Pete Rose did a USO tour with Joe DiMaggio. They were entertaining troops around Saigon for 23 days. 23 days in Saigon. Eventually, the two had to share a makeshift jungle shower together. And Pete Rose described naked DiMaggio by saying, and I quote, I turned around 
And all I could see was this giant penis with Joe DiMaggio hanging off the end of it. So it was like four inches? <laughs> yeah, and I had a girl. No, so <laughs> Joe DiMaggio had one of the biggest cocks uh, in Hollywood or, or whatever you want to say it today. And the other guy that supposedly had one of the biggest cocks in Hollywood at that time was Milton Berle. Mm. You know what they both had in common? They both fucked Marilyn Monroe. Joe DiMaggio was married to Marilyn Monroe at some point. And that's the second thing I'm going to tell you about Joe DiMaggio. The first was his big dick. Well, actually, the first was that he signed the biggest contract in 1949 for $100,000. The second was that he had an enormous hog, an enormous Italian hog. And the third is that he was so devastated after Marilyn Monroe died. We're going to talk about Marilyn in a little bit because she's one of the lyrics that he had a half a dozen red roses delivered three times a week to her crypt for 20 years. 20 years he had flowers delivered three times a week to her grave he never married again joe did marilyn did he never married again and joe dimaggio's last words his last words were i finally get to see marilyn so it's it's sneakily one of the best love stories in the history of celebrity joe dimaggio and marilyn monroe we get into it in a couple of uh episodes on this one but uh i've always been fascinated by it like, I would think that if I was to say on my deathbed, I finally get to see St. Anne, that would make sense. It you would know what make I mean? sense because I'm definitely going first. Yeah. yeah. yeah we'll see about that. <laughs> All right. That takes us to our first uh, ad. Second ad because our presenting sponsor, but it's Blender's Eyewear. Blender's Eyewear, you can get everything from them as far as like sun, snow, prescription, blue light, all that kind of stuff. They want you to know what I bought from them. They ask for a personal thing. And I tell you all the time, I have problems with my eyes because I look at the computer at night. And sometimes I'm in a dark room with just the computer and I'm going through all this kind of shit. So I got blue light glasses from them and I got the Ice Crush. Ice Crush are the ones that I got. But they have ones that are very similar to the Ice Crush called Ice Palace. So either one are very, very similar. The Ice Crush is what I have. They're great blue light glasses and they cut down on my headaches. You can go and get everything from them. The only other products that I tried from them is I was going to like some sort of snow thing with Mick, took him skiing, and I wound up taking one of their, um, uh, one of their snow goggles from PFT. PFT had a couple extra at his desk. So I took one of their snow goggle things, and they're awesome too. So Blender's Eyewear is one of our sponsors this year. And they fit. Yeah. Chase Fisher started it by selling beachy shades out of a backpack while doubling as a surf instructor on Pacific Beach. His goal was to create mid-priced eyewear that has the same cool factor as other leading styles, and he did it, right? Their team of in-house designers are constantly coming out with new styles from orange polarized wraparounds, tortoise shell frames with purple lenses, to classic gold arms on black lenses. And it's not just sunglasses, as I said. Prescriptions, readers, blue lights, as well as a snow collection with goggles and accessories. So what I need you to do is I need you to go to BlendersEyewear.com. BlendersEyewear.com and just check it out. If you're spending a lot of money on glasses still, you're a fucking moron. If you're going into Pearl Vision and they're taking it right through your asshole, you're a moron. Try BlendersEyewear.com and enter the promo code TWISTEDVIP. TWISTEDVIP. I like the sound of that. So BlendersEyewear.com, code TWISTEDVIP, and you'll get 15% off. Blenders. The, uh, the thing is rocked with pride worldwide. I kind of like it, but I'm going to tell you right now, the blue light glasses are what I have, and they definitely work. Back to the song. It's been a couple of seconds without me singing, and I know everybody wants me back. Joe McCarthy, Richard Nixon, Suter, Baker, Television, North Korea, uh, excuse me, North Korea, South Korea, Marilyn Monroe. All right? So now we're in the 1950s, and this stanza is just events from 1950. Joel starts out very, very structured. Like I told you, the last stanza was, it's almost like a stanza and a half, was 48-49, now we're just getting into the 50s. This is all from 1950, just 1950. Joe McCarthy on February 9th, 1950, he's a Republican Senator Joseph R. McCarthy of Wisconsin, begins his anti-communism crusade with his Lincoln Day speech. He then spent almost five years in this hyper-suspicious atmosphere of the Cold War, trying in vain to expose communists and other left-wing loyalty risks in the U.S. government. So Joe McCarthy started his Red Scare, this Republican senator from Wisconsin, started his anti-communist shit on February 9th, 1950. Joe McCarthy, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, in 1950, is first elected to the United States Senate, 
We just did a whole podcast on Richard Nixon. I love the fucking guy. He was a great president until he wasn't, Mm -hmm. right? So he's first elected to the Senate in 1950. Three years later, he would win VP under Eisenhower. He had that one speech where he brought the dog out and shit like that. Mm -hmm. And then he'll be VP for two terms and then lose that 1961 presidential election to a handsome JFK. I don't know why, but just gave you 11 years of of Nixon's life because it couldn't help myself. (laughs) But here it is. Joe McCarthy, Richard Nixon. Joe McCarthy starts the Red Scare. Richard Nixon becomes a United States senator. Studebaker television. Studebaker. This is the only reason why I'd rather have Vibs here than you, Annie, for just one sentence. Studebaker is a popular popular American automobile manufacturer based in South Bend, Indiana. I know this. It's the only fucking reason I need Vibs here. We've been there. We've been to the museum. We've had dinner in the museum. So the Studebaker Museum, I think, is still alive. I went to school in South Bend. The Studebaker Museum is very fucking cool. And then the old Studebaker Mansion was converted into a fancy restaurant. Jeez, I can't remember what the restaurant's name is, but I really don't care. But the Studebaker <laughs> Mansion was a fancy restaurant. I think it's still around. I haven't been there in shit decades. But Studebakers were big in South Bend, Indiana. But in 1950, Studebakers began their financial decline after losing a price war with Ford and General Motors, the big boys. Somehow Studebaker would hang on until November 1967 when the last Studebaker had rolled off the line. But 1950 was that inflection point. The year that we're talking about right now was that inflection point where Studebaker lost its fastball. Studebaker television. Television. Electronic television was first successfully demonstrated in San Francisco in 1927. Which is crazy to think about, right? Yeah, way before this. We're talking about 1950. So television was shown, demonstrated in 1927. And the first practical TV sets were demonstrated and sold to the public at the 1939 World's Fair in New York, the World's Fairgrounds in Queens. That's 1939. But it wasn't until 1950 that television officially became widespread throughout Europe and North America. So it was a, first of all, it was a time machine when it was shown to people in 1927. In 1939, At the World's Fair, it was a luxury item that not everybody could afford. Everyone was using radios back then. Mm -hmm. And around 1950, that's when television became acceptable and found in almost every house. Studebaker Television, North Korea, South Korea, Marilyn Monroe. I hope you're not sick of my fucking singing because I'm just getting started. North Korea, South Korea. The Korean War began on June 25th, 1950, when North Korea invaded South Korea. The fighting ended on July 27th, 1953, when the Korean Armistice Agreement was signed. The agreement created the DMZ to separate North and South Korea. North Korea and South Korea was the beginning of the Korean War. Thanks, Billy Joel. And then finally, Marilyn Monroe. In 1950... Marilyn Monroe appeared in five films, including The Asphalt uh, Asphalt Jungle uh, Jungle and All About Eve. So it was a big year for Marilyn Monroe. And at the very end of that year, in December of 1950, Monroe negotiated a seven-year contract with 20th Century Fox. So arguably 1950 was the biggest professional year for, uh, for Miss Marilyn. So that's why she's mentioned in that stanza. Apparently okay. it was big for her a couple of ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joe D. All no, right, so girl. we're going on to the next one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rosenberg's H-Bomb, Sugar Ray, Panjumam, Brando and the King and I, and the Catcher in the Rye. Ooh. So that's the next one. I nailed it again. Mm-hmm. Rosenberg's Just H-Bomb, it. It Sugar Ray, Panjumam, Brando and the King and I, and the Catcher in the Rye. Again, all 1951. And you're probably saying, Lawrence, he's, does he do this through 1989? We're going to be here for fucking days. No, he doesn't. He's in, particularly in part Mine two. Quick. Part two, he kind of <laughs> skips above. So we'll go. The Rosenbergs. The Rosenbergs I spoke about before, it was Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. They're convicted of heading a spy ring that passed top secret information concerning the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union. They were the American spies, the Russian spies, like that show The Americans. They would go on to become the first U.S. citizens to be convicted and executed for espionage during peacetime. 
That, that's never happened before. It's happened during wars. But during peacetime, they were the first U.S. citizens to be convicted and executed during peacetime. Went on June 19th, 1953. Right, So it started in 51, 53, they were put to death at Sing Sing Prison in beautiful Ossining, New York. Both refused to admit any wrongdoing and pro- proclaim their innocence right up until the time of their death. And they were both killed when they flipped the fucking switch in the electric chair. There is a lot of controversy surrounding the Rosenbergs. I won't get into it now, but just know around 1951... Every eye was turned on what was going on with Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, the Russian spies. Okay? H-bomb. Rosenberg's H-bomb. On January 31st, 1950, President Harry Truman publicly announced his decision to support the development of the hydrogen bomb. The hydrogen bomb was a weapon that was theorized to be hundreds of times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped on Japan during World War II. So by 1951, the year from the stanza, the United States is developing the hydrogen bomb as a nuclear weapon. And on November 1st, 1952, the United States successfully detonated the one, it was just called Mike. It was named after me. It was the world's first hydrogen bomb. They detonated on an Awitak Atoll in the Pacific Marshall Islands. The 10.4 megaton thermonuclear device called Mike instantly vaporized an entire island and left behind a crater more than a mile wide. So the H-bomb is brought in earnest in 1951. Rosenberg's H-bomb, Sugar Ray, Panjumam. I love the fact they were up to Sugar Ray because you know I'm a boxing guy. Ah, uh, just fall on a flat. No, wrong fe- one. Yeah, not, for, yeah, not that <laughs> asshole. On February 14th, 1951, Sugar Ray Robinson and Jake LaMotta. Jake LaMotta is the Raging Bull. Mm-hmm. The movie Raging Bull with Robert De Niro is based on Jake LaMotta. They met for their sixth and final time. The fight would become known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It was Valentine's Day 1951. Robinson won the undisputed world middleweight title with a 13th round KO, dealing LaMotta his first legitimate knockout in 95 professional bouts. So Jake was only knocked out one time prior to fighting Sugar Ray. Sorry to go off script, but I just happened to know this. And then that fight was, there was like some sort of cheating involved by the guy who knocked him out. So the fight was a no contest. So officially Jake LaMotta went 95 fights before he was knocked out. And he and you never knock me down, right? So and it happened against Sugar Ray Robinson. They fought six times. Lamada, who was I've met Jake Lamada. Lamada had said later on, I fought this is a quote from Jake Lamada, which is awesome. Figure this, like he's an old Italian guy, you know, bent nose type dude. Whenever there was a fight in Madison Square Garden, Madison Square Garden is very good with introducing ex fighters. Mm-hmm. Particularly if they're New York people or have fought in New York. Yeah. So like Jerry Cooney when he's at a fight. He always gets a standing ovation. Who's else in the audience? Roy Jones Jr. Roy Jones Jr. will stand up. Who else is in the audience? That's an old felt forum thing. That was cool. Yeah. That place was awesome. Jake LaMotta. Jake LaMotta gets up, gets into the ring, and starts dancing around. They're like, no, no, Jake, go sit down. (laughs) So Jake LaMotta had fought Sugar Ray uh, six times. This is a quote from Jake LaMotta. I fought Sugar so often I almost got diabetes. That's awesome. (laughs) Robinson won five of the six bouts with LaMotta. Okay. Last thing about Sugar Ray Robinson, which is kind of eerie, and I know you love this shit. In June 1947, he was scheduled to defend his title against a guy named Jimmy Doyle. Robinson initially backed out of the fight because he had a dream that he was going to kill Doyle. He had a priest and a minister sent sent in to convince him to fight. His team said, get us a priest, get us a minister, and let's talk about how dreams don't come true. That's not how God works. Right? That's not how it works in my house. Right. But his dream was proven to be true. On June mm-hmm. 25th, See? 1947, Robinson dominated Doyle and scored a decisive knockout in the eighth round that knocked Doyle unconscious and resulted in Doyle's death later that night. After learning of Doyle's intention of using the bout's money to buy his mother a house, Sugar Ray Robinson, one of the greatest fighters of all time, mm-hmm. arguably maybe the best fighter of all time, so he found out that Doyle was going to use the uh, money to buy his mother a house. He gave Doyle's mother the money from his next four bouts so she could purchase whatever the fuck she wanted, including a home and fulfilling her son's last intention. Hmm. I think that's a great story. Very much so. Yeah. Sugar Ray Robinson. Boxers are all heart. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me. 
Uh, Rosenberg's H bomb, Sugar Ray. Oh, okay. So Pam and John. Like people when they were learning the the words to this uh they were like, What the fuck is Pam and John? <laughs> Pam and John's a small village just north of the border between North and South Korea. It's a location of truce talks mm-hmm. between between the two and where the nineteen fifty three uh, agreement uh, that paused the Korean War was signed. So Panjamon was just a uh, was a linchpin in the uh, Korean War. That's why it gets mentioned there. Then it goes Brando, the King and I, and the Catcher in the Rye. We all know who Marlon Brando is. He was nominated for his first Academy Award for Best Actor for his role in A Streetcar Named Desire in 1951. That's why he gets the nod during this stanza. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, at the 1973 Academy Awards, Brando refused to accept the Oscar he won for The Godfather. Instead, he sang, uh, he sent Sachin Littlefeather to represent him at the ceremony. She, she appeared in full Apache attire and stated that owing to the poor treatment of Native Americans in the film industry, Brando would not accept the award. So in 1951, he got nominated for Streetcar. 1973, he wins for his Don Corleone but he turns it down because of the poor treatment of Native Americans. And then let's fast forward to 1996, shall we? Mm-hmm. And he goes on Larry King to tell uh, Larry King and everybody else that Hollywood is run by the Jews. He was also obsessed with flatulence. I mean, the guy was a whack. I mean, he really was. He wanted to like harness the- electrical power from eels. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like- but I like, I like the fact that, you know, uh, Indians are mistreated. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a, I'm a champion for the Jewish culture in this, in this thing. But then he goes on and starts shitting on the Jews. And by the way, that wasn't a one-off. He did a Playboy article, too. And he simply stated, like, I'm going to use some racial terms. You can see an N-word portrayed in Hollywood, meaning the worst of black society. You would, you would call the N-word, he would. And you could see that in Hollywood. You could see a Mick portrayed in Hollywood, like the worst part of Irish society. The drunken, wife-beating gangster. You could see the uh, whatever derogatory word he used for the Chinese. I don't want to say it. The C word. C-H-I-N. Whatever. Portrayed in Hollywood. You know, that type of stuff. You could see the Filipino, he said specifically. But you'll never see a K-I-K-E. That's what he had said. And then because the Jews own Hollywood, so they would never let the representation of the worst part of their cu- culture shown. That was Brando's anti-Semitism. And he doubled down on that Playboy article that he uh, that he did where he mentioned that when he went on Larry King. Yikes. To which, and, and look it up, to which like Larry King was like, by the way, Marlon, I'm Jewish. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just it was just very, very un- uncomfortable. So uh, believe me, I, I love the Godfather as much as the next. Right. Marlon Brando is a little bit the of a fucking douchebag. He was like really tight with Michael Jackson because his son was a security guard there. Right. And there's like this big rumor that on September 11th, him, Michael Jackson and Liz Taylor were all in New York City and they rented a car and they drove, you know, they drove out like I don't know where they went to, right. but they stopped at like they did like a. um a tour of like all KFCs and Burger Kings. <laughs> like that always, like some people are like, no, no, Liz Taylor was never in the car. He, they were all just very close. Yeah. But no one's ever debunked the Michael Jackson, Marlon Brando one though. Yeah. Find me, find me a good Hollywood story nowadays. All right. So Brando, The King and I, and The Catcher in the Rye. The King and I is the fifth musical by the aforementioned Rodgers and Hammerstein. Stein. Stein. To open up on Broadway. <laughs> This musical was another immediate hit, winning Tony Awards for Best Musical, Best Actress, and Best Actor for Mr. Yul Brenner, an iconic bald man. I just yeah. said it. Westworld guy, Yul Brenner, The King and I. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, so The King and I opened up on that year on Broadway in 1951. And they wanted to cancel him, right? Because he was playing a different... It's just a matter of time for I get canceled at, at this point. And The Catcher in the Rye. Speaking about ca- canceling. So this was a controversial mm-hmm. novel by J.D. Salinger. It was partially published in serial form from 1945 to 1946. You got it in chapter by chapter, but published by a novel in 1951. Thank you, Mr. Joel. After fatally shooting John Lennon in 1980, Mark David Chapman was arrested with a copy of the book in his pocket, and he wasn't the only assassin to have it. A couple of other assassins, their names escape me, all had Catcher in the Rye on their person somewhere. So Catcher in the Rye was released in 1951. It gets some shine on We Didn't Start the Fire. You think that's an urban legend? 
Or do you think they actually had the book? No, no. I think I think it's, there's no reason for it to be an ur- urban legend. You don't have to I shoot it know. down. Uh, so we'll go to 1952. Eisenhower vaccine. England's got a new queen. Marciano Liberace. Satayana goodbye. Yeah, so that's the one. I, mm-hmm. Yeah. Eisenhower vaccine. Eisenhower. Dwight D. Eisenhower. In the 1952 United States presidential election, he defeated Adlai Stevenson in a landslide with an electoral margin of 442 to 89, marking the first Republican return to the White House in 20 years. So there was no Republicans in the White House since 1932. In 1952, Dwight D., double D, comes in and becomes the first Republican. He was the last president born in the 19th century. He was the oldest president elect at the time at 62 since James Buchanan back in 1856. He was the third commanding general of the army to serve as president after George Washington and Ulysses S. Grant. And he's the last to have not held political office prior to being president until Donald Trump entered office in 2017. So one word, they give him Eisenhower and I give you all that shit. He was the last guy to not have held political office. Obama was a community organizer. Donald Trump was nothing. He was a real estate mogul. And Eisenhower was a general, along with George Washington and Ulysses S. Grant. That's pretty cool. Eisenhower vaccine. Vaccine for polio was successfully developed by Jonas Salk in 1952. But as I'd mentioned, Mm -hmm. uh, Salk didn't want it out. He condemned its immediate use uh, for widespread use. And he wound up being right because a bunch of kids had died, right? So, But in 1942, it was developed by Jonas Salk. The final thing that went into arms that Elvis Presley was like, go get your vaccine, oh. right? <laughs> that didn't happen until a couple years later. But 1952, Salk came out. You don't like my Elvis Presley? Please don't laugh at me when I'm fucking... Wearing a leopard jumpsuit? Uh, yeah. I won't, I promise. By the way, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice if you're listening to this podcast on any... If you're listening to this podcast, I hope you're doing it on the Two Cents app. But you're doing yourself a disservice because you should be watching it on YouTube. Not because for Because I look fucking it's fantastic today. I have, to, uh, <laughs> I have to tape something later on for a Canelo fight. So uh, Eisenhower vaccine, England's got a new queen. Who do you think that is? It's that old bitch, Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> She's crowned, right? She's crowned... In 1952, uh, 70 years later, and she's still in the office, making her easily the longest reigning incumbent monarch and also the longest reigning documented female monarch in history. We can't get rid of her. She's holding on for a reason. They need to keep her 95-year-old ass propped up on the (laughs) throne for two and a half more years if she's going to beat my man, my my boy, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, <laughs> the sun god, for the longest reigning monarch in history. And I will still take the fucking under. I don't think that old limey bitch makes it. I am Team Louis XIV. <laughs> Join me, will you? All right, so England's got a new team, a uh, new queen. Marciano Liberace. Satayana, goodbye. Rocky Marciano defeats Jersey Joe Walcott on September 23rd, 1952, becoming the world heavyweight boxing champion. Marciano held the world heavyweight title from 1952 to 1956. If there's one thing that everybody knows about Rocky Marciano is that he is the only heavyweight champion to have finished his career undefeated at 49-0. I know Floyd went undefeated, but the only heavyweight champ that never came back for a little bit of money and lost or embarrassed himself like what Evander Holyfield is doing now. Rocky Marciano walked away at 49-0. and He's the only heavyweight champion in the world to finish his career undefeated. 13th round on Twisted History. Yeah, why not? Liberace. Liberace. Um, Lee. I loved him. <laughs> Lee. Liberace first broadcast the Liberace show. This show was so fucking popular with mostly female television audience Gaze and me. How did you not love him? He was just such a great, he was just so happy, right? The guy just And he was a talented pianist. What's up? It drew over 30 million viewers at any one time and received 10,000 fan letters per week. Liberace was secretly diagnosed HIV positive on August, in August of 1985 by his private physician in Las Vegas, 18 months before his death. So Liberace eventually uh, succumbed to uh, HIV AIDS. Um, but when he had the H with well, the HIV show, the Liberace show, <laughs> I was gonna say what? <laughs> yeah, the Liberace show was a banger. And then finally, he says, "Satayana, goodbye." 
I don't know why this guy gets his own thing, but he does. George Satayana was a philosopher. He's an essayist. He was a poet. He was a novelist. He died in 1952, right? The only thing that I'll tell you about Satayana is that he is um, credited with one of my favorite quotes. He's credited with this quote. Those who, do not, uh, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. And it's one of the reasons why sure. we try to say stuff that isn't necessarily politically correct on this to try and reflect the ignorance of the times that we're talking about. Because if you don't learn history, you're doomed to repeat it. I say it time and time again. Satayana, George Satayana, goodbye. Um, he died in 1952. All right, so this is the first time it goes to weed and start the fire, blah, 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 blah. So that's the chorus, right? So there's no better time than to go into an ad at the chorus and Simply Safe. I have a beneficiary of Simply Safe sitting next to me. When Annie was attacked by the German <laughs> Shepherd, Simply Safe caught it all on tape. If I wanted to sue the balls off my fucking neighbor, or if I just wanted to show the footage to the cops when they had come, it's because Simply Safe. The only thing it didn't do was protect my wife from a German shepherd, but it certainly taped the whole fucking thing. All right. Um, Simply safe. It's it's a customizable home security system, right? It's a comprehensive system with 24-7 professional monitoring, so you'll always have someone looking out for you. Plans cost under a dollar a day depending on what you do with no long-term contracts or hidden fees ever. You can customize the perfect system for your house in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash twisted. S-I-M-P-L-I-S-A-F-E dot com slash twisted. And once they send it to you, it takes about an hour to put up depending on what you get. You can get outdoor cameras with this dramatic resolution, all the little monitors and shit for your windows and doors, everything. So go to simplysafe.com slash twisted today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off when you sign up for interactive monitoring. It's very easy. Go to simplysafe.com slash twisted. So the next chorus is Joseph Stalin, Melenkov, Nasserim, Prokaviyev, Rockefeller, Campanella, Communist, Block. That's it, right? Stalin, Melenkov, Nasser, Pro- Prokofiev, Rockefeller, Campanella, Campy, communist bloc. So this all happened in 1953, right? We're being very, very, I don't, he, he really does a great job. Billy Joel does a great job from a historian's point of view, if you can call me a historian. From a bullshit historian's point of view, I think Billy Joel does a great job. So this is it. Annie, can you do this one? 1953, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, he dies in 1953. So I'm not going to I'm not going to give a history lesson the way you did. I'm going to kind of just touch upon them kind of quickly. So Joseph Stalin was the leader of the Soviet Union. He died suddenly on March 5th, 1953 from a massive hemorrhagic, am I saying that? Hemorrhagic? Hemorrhagic, yeah. Stroke involving the left cerebral hemisphere of his brain. Yeah. His brain brain blew up. it, It basically blew up, yes. His death marked the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union, was, which was ultimately dissolved December 26, 1991. It's been reported that Stalin was responsible for more than 20 million deaths. Mm-hmm. So good riddance, right? Right. So we went from Lenin to Stalin. Right. Stalin dies. He dies. Someone has to replace him. Introduce Georgi Malenkov. You want to sing it? Yeah, so it's <laughs> Joseph Stalin Malenkov. So uh, Georgi Melenkov succeeded Stalin for six months. He was a member of Stalin's inner circle and served as the premier of the country, while Nikita Khrushchev was the first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. They had a struggle, a power struggle, and in 1961, Georgi was ultimately kicked out of the party, and then ultimately Georgi was forced to move to Kazakhstan. So, so long to him. That's perfect. And then we're going to talk about Khrushchev in a couple of minutes. Right. Mm-hmm. So we're going Joseph Stalin, Malenkov, Nasser, and Prokofiev. Who's Nasser? So Nasser, Gamal Abdel Nasser, acts as the true power behind the new Egyptian nation as Mohammed Naguib's minister of the interior. He was formally elected president June of 1956. And after his national, excuse me, his nationalization of the Suez Canal Company and his political victory in the subsequent Suez Crisis, known in Egypt as the tripartite aggression, uh, the popularity of Egypt and the Arab world skyrocketed. So he kind of put them on the, ma- the map from an um, industrial perspective. And we're going to talk about him again when it's trouble in the Suez. <laughs> 
That has yes. to do with Gamal Abdel Nasser. So we have now Joseph Stalin Malenkov Nasser. Who is Prokofiev? Sergei Prokofiev, a popular Russian composer. So what's sad about this guy is that is it was more it was his death. Obviously, he composed his first piano piece at age five and his first opera at age nine. Okay. But when he died at the age of sixty-one, he died the same day as Stalin. Oh. And, you know, they announced Stalin was dead. Everybody was in the streets mourning him. So for three days, there were thousands of people mourning Stalin. They couldn't even move this guy's body out of his home. Oh, so but, in 1953, he gets the Farrah Fawcett treatment. Correct. Farrah Fawcett dies the same day as Michael Jackson, and nobody even knows that Farrah is dead. If it wasn't for me. I think maybe even Ed McMahon also died around that time, too. Yeah, I think Totally right. got washed. But you wonder why Sergei Prokofiev is, is in this song. He was a composer. Right. Okay. He was a piano composer, and that's, you know, you, you have to imagine Makes the sense. impact he had on Billy Joel. Mm -hmm. Then we get to the Rockefellers. Would you like to sing the Rockefellers too? Uh, Rockefeller Campan no, Rockefeller Campanella Communist Block. Okay. So there's a few Rockefellers that he could be alluding to, but it, there was a big scandal in 53. It was when Winthrop Rockefeller. Winthrop. <laughs> divorced wow. Barbara Fucking Sears name. Rockefeller, okay. who was also known as Bobo. And the thing was about her was that she was the one who coined the phrase, who do you think I am, a Rockefeller? Nice. She, was, she was big on um, being economical, and once she got divorced from him, if she felt she was being overcharged, she would say that to somebody. So that, that, be, that coined that mm -hmm. term. But it's then, a big, That's a big term with my mom when I was growing up. What are we, Rockefellers? Mm -hmm. No, I just want another soda. <laughs> so Winthrop Rockefeller has a highly publicized divorce that year in 53 so even though there's Nelson and John D. Rockefeller all around the place it was Winthrop he was referring to in 1953 I believe so okay Rockefeller Campanella who the hell is Campanella oh hold on hold on there's, oh I'm sorry I apologize don't skip over Nelson I apologize Nelson was the 40, 41st vice president to mm -hmm. Gerald Ford. He was the 49th governor of New York but there's an interesting fact about him okay that a lot of people might not know his fifth son, Michael, who was also a twin with Mary, disappeared during an expedition in the Azmat region of the southwestern Netherlands, New Guinea, uh -huh. which what is now part of <laughs> which is now part of the Indonesian province Papua. Uh -huh. He was believed to have been eaten by their uh, shoreline villagers in November of 1961. So a Rockefeller was eaten by cannibals. Correct. Understood. And then um, he was officially declared dead in 1964, which brings us to Roy Campanella. Am Campanella. I going too fast? No, I think it's, I think this is a perfect pace. Okay. So then we have Roy Campanella. Would you like to sing it? Uh, Rockefeller Campanella Communist Block. Okay. So Roy Campanella, a baseball catcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers, received the nation's the National League's Most Valuable Player Award for the second time. That's in 1950. So that's why he's mentioned. Correct. Right? Because he wins the MVP second time. Okay. And in 48, he became the first one of the first black players to break baseball's color barrier. Mm -hmm. um, but sadly, um, unfortunately, he was in a car accident. He was driving. He was alone. And he hit a patch of ice when his Chevy sedan hit a telephone pole, right. breaking his back. And he was paralyzed from the waist down, so he was no longer able to play baseball. I will tell you this. I think that baseball fans who are younger, who have some interest in baseball history, probably know of Roy Campanella, probably know of Campy, probably know of him being, of being a great catcher, Probably know of him being a Brooklyn Dodger. Mm -hmm. I bet a lot of them don't know that he was black. I know Campanella is, first of all, he wasn't overly, like he had, a, his fa his father was Italian, his mother was black. That's mm -hmm. why he has the name Campanella. So he, he, you know, he was mixed. He looked kind of Italian and kind of black. Um, but I would bet, because I forget about it too. I forgot that Campanella was one of those guys that was at the forefront, you know, because you think of Campanella, yeah. like he would, he should be at the forefront of making Italian ices. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, so he's at the forefront of uh, breaking the color barrier too. All right, what about communist block? So this one is kind of long, and I don't know how um, other another way to give it except to kind of bullet point it. Mm -hmm. Communist block, the Eastern German uprising of 1903, is crushed by Volkspolizei and the group of Soviet forces in Germany. 1953, yeah. So it happened June 6th and 17th of 1953. Originally, it began as a strike by construction workers in East Berlin against work quotas. It was right in the middle of the Sovietization process in East Germany. And the small strike demonstration escalated overnight into a widespread uprising against the government of East Germany and the Socialist Unity Party. It involved over 1, 1 million people oh. and 700 localities. Oh. 
That's Ulti- big. It's, it was huge. I mean, and it escalated so quickly. And so, so I, I think if we give the people that scope, mm-hmm. right, of what's going on, then we'll tell them. The communist bloc, so this is 1953, right? So it's post-World War. Mm-hmm. So you got to think about what Europe looks like post-World War. Germany was basically put in timeout. So the Soviet right. Union owned a, a good chunk of Eastern Europe. So like East Germany... Khrushchev built the wall in Germany. The Russian mm-hmm. Khrushchev built the wall in Germany. East right. Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Albania. I don't even mention Ukraine because this is way before Ukraine had their fucking independence, right? Right. They were solidly Russian. So I think just by him saying communist bloc and being in 1953, it puts us in that mindset that the Soviets, this is Cold War time, and mm-hmm. the Soviets own most of Eastern Europe. Right. It was Bulgaria, Cuba... Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, and Romania. Nicaragua, Grenada. Like Mm -hmm. all these other places kind of dipped in there. And then on the east of Russia, you had, um, you know, North Korea. You had, you know, all these other things over going on in Asia. So just know that the Russian bear at this time, just by this asshole, Billy Joel, this midget from Long Island mentioning this, it gives you sort of like, don't you think that just mentioned communist bloc was... Like everybody massive. knew about this thing, yeah. Yeah, it was absolutely massive, and right. and it wasn't treated kindly either. It was it was ultimately but and violently suppressed by tanks of the Soviet forces in Germany. One hundred percent. And finally, the demonstrators died out after several days, and the uprising the uprisings were actually celebrated in West Germany on June sixteenth as a public holiday until the nineteen nineties, and it was ultimately replaced by German Unity Day and switched to October third. German which, Unity Day, which is like That's beautiful. You know, I, you know, I, I love the way the Germans celebrate yeah. stuff. Yeah, so do I. Walter Tag, right? What's yeah, yeah. Good, uh, <laughs> Vater Tag, whatever. Their Father's Day is the greatest. It's the greatest. All right, so next one. So that was Joseph Stalin, Malenkov, Nasser, and Prokofiev, Rockefeller, Camp, and Nella, Communist Bloc. Thanks, sweetheart. So now next one. <laughs> Roy Cohn, Juan Perón, Tuscanini, Dak Ron, D- DNBN, Foo Falls, Rock Around the Clock. Because it rhymes with Communist Bloc. So Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn in 1954. This is all going to be 1954, and he just did 1953. Roy Cohn resigns as Joseph McCarthy's chief counsel and enters private practice. Why do I know Roy Cohn, Large? I'll tell you why. Before he aided McCarthy, who we mentioned before with the Red Scare, in his commie witch hunt, he was the prosecutor on that Rosenberg trial, the one where the Russian spies became the first Mm -hmm. U.S. citizens to be convicted and executed of espionage during peacetime. I mentioned them. So Roy Cohn is all over this fucking thing. He went from... He went from prosecuting the Rosenbergs and killing them mm-hmm. to then becoming Joseph McCarthy's mouthpiece during the witch hunt. And then he left in 1954 to go into the uh, private space. Later on, he would represent and mentor some real estate developer you may have never heard of named Donald Trump right. during his early business career. Roy mm-hmm. Cohn has touched a lot of fucking history. He eventually died of AIDS. And he was played by Al Pacino in that HBO movie or series called Angels in America. I've never seen it, but I know Al Pacino played him. Roy Cohn. Mm-hmm. You know, so if people just say Roy Cohn, Juan Perón, like maybe they go to Ron Perón, whatever. Roy Cohn was a big fucking deal. Yeah. And he's, his name isn't that, I don't think his name is attached to as much, it's attached to everything, but it's. Not oh. p- first. Organized crime, McCarthyism, yeah. mm-hmm. the Rosenbergs, Donald Trump, AIDS, yeah. like all these different things that have happened that are just historical things. So Roy, so Roy Cohn gets a mention by Billy Joel, and now you know about him. You're welcome. <laughs> Roy Cohn, Juan Perón. Juan Perón is at the height of his power in 1954. What was he? He was the president of Argentina before a coup the following year that would toss him the fuck out. But in 1954, Juan Perón... Right. He was sympathetic to hiding Nazis. He thought the Nuremberg trials were a travesty. So he was like, Nazis are welcome here in Argentina after World War Two. He was friends with Che Guevara. And you might remember that Perón name from Eva Perón, right. who was Evita. Right. Mm-hmm. Don't cry for me, Argentina. Right. Juan Perón was uh, the president of Argentina in 1954. Roy Cohn, Juan Perón, Tuscanini, Doc Ron, Arturo Tuscanini. In 1954, is at the height of his fame as a conductor, performing regularly with the NBC Symphony, uh, Symphony Orchestra on U.S. national radio. So, in the same way that you mentioned Sergei 
Prokofiev. Right. I'll mention Arturo Toscanini as one of Billy Joel's obvious musical mentors yes. to a degree. And maybe so, there's another reason, but yeah. that's, you know, it makes sense to me. Toscanini, <laughs> Dacron. Dacron was big. Dacron was big in 1954 because uh, polyester was all the rage, mm-hmm. but they needed something that was not as cheap. So DuPont made Dacron. Right. Dacron is a better, fancier form of polyester. Polyester mm-hmm. was invented in the early 1940s by British scientists. Dacron was invented by DuPont in the early 50s. So by 1954, if you had a polyester couch, you were poor. Right. If you had a Dacron couch, you weren't poor. So that's what Dacron is. Then this one, DNB and Foo Falls rock around the clock. DNB and Foo Falls... Yeah, I had to look that one up. That's the fall of this mm-hmm. French Vietnamese camp to the Viet uh, to the Viet Minh, uh, right. that led to the creation of North Vietnam and South Vietnam as separate states. So it's not Dien Bien Phu falls like it's some set of waterfalls. Dien Bien Phu had fell to mm-hmm. Viet Minh forces and it created the North and South Vietnam separation. Okay, and then finally, rock around the clock. I know rock around the clock. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock, boom, right? I'm singing a lot today. On April 12, 1954, Bill Haley and his comments recorded, we're going to rock around the clock. It was the first rock and roll record to reach number one on the U.S. charts. By 1955, this seemingly inane song, right, had international success that caused rioting in schools and cinemas because it became the first teen anthem. Right? It became everything that Nirvana would want their song to be. The American Legion and the Boy Scouts denounced it. The New York Times called it nightmarish and blood curdling. And after it incited a near riot in a local theater, the city of Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee, banned it. So just know that benign little, we're going to rock around the clock tonight, mm-hmm. was a badass song. Right? Yeah. It got kids, you know, their panties in a bunch. They wiggled their hips. They didn't like it. Right. I like the way you did. Do you mind doing the next one? Einstein, James Dean, Brooklyn's Got a Winning Team, Davy Crockett, Peter Pan, Elvis Presley, Disneyland. I I bang that again. I'll do that lower. Einstein, James Dean, Brooklyn's Got a Winning Team, Davy Crockett, Peter (laughs) Pan, Elvis Presley, Disneyland. All 1955. So Einstein, Albert Einstein. What happened to him in 55? So he died. Oh. He died. Ah. So everybody knows like the history of Albert Einstein and what yeah. a great scientist he is. But in death, I think what's kind of it's kind of interesting and very twisted. Uh-huh. He died at Princeton Hospital in New Jersey. Okay. Shout and the out. doctor that performed his autopsy, the pathologist's name was Dr. Thomas Harvey. Harvey determined that Einstein died of an abnormal aortic aneurysm. Okay. And that should have been the end of it, but it wasn't. This is where things get dicey because Dr. Harvey took liberties with Einstein's brain. Ooh. without permission, which is, you know, he essentially stole Einstein's brain. Now, 60 years later, the, ex- the only permanent place to see pieces of Einstein's brain, well, I don't know if it's 60 years, I got to do my right. math better, um, is at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. Okay. They, it, like he put it, he put Einstein's brain into, he gave it to a museum, which is insane. But one a cool thing about it now is that if you want to see Einstein's brain, you can. And it's placed and housed with Chang and Eng. Changanang Bunker. Changanang Bunker. Mm-hmm. Uh, nine Inch Nailed Together is the b- blog I wrote on those guys. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So Einstein in 1955 dies at the age of 76, mm-hmm. and his brain is somewhere in a museum. I have a quick joke. What's the, uh, what's the smartest thing to ever come out of Marilyn Monroe's mouth? Albert Einstein's dick. Wow. <laughs> that's disgusting. All right, so Einstein, James Dean. What happened to James Dean in 1955? <laughs> So James Dean, unfortunately, very sad. He was only 24 he years old. He died also in 55? Uh, he's Fucking 20. Fucking Billy Joel, huh? He was only 24, so he's not a part of the 27 Club. Right. Uh, but how many movies do you think he made? Uh, but he, only, he was only 24 when he died? Yes. I don't know. 17. He, he made three. Three movies. And all, two of East them were of released. Eden, uh, Giant and... Rebel Without a Cause. Rebel Without a Cause. Rebel, yeah. Two of them were released posthumously. Okay. So what happened to him was, is that he owned this... Um, Porsche 550 Spider, which he named Little Bastard. Okay. He was banned from driving and racing from uh, Warner Brothers because they felt that he was just too much of a, a rebel. Go figure. Sure. So as soon as he finished filming, he took his mechanic, Rolf Wuthererichafter. I don't know how to pronounce his Close name. Enough. And they were driving up to Salinas to go to a race right away. He was, he was headed for a race when a gentleman by the name of Donald Turnipseed 
Ooh. pulled out in front of him. He was a 23-year-old veteran and a Cal Poly student, and they had a head-on collision. Unfortunately for um, Dean, his car was, you know, a very light car, and it flipped God knows how many times, and he was, he was killed at the scene. They said that, his, uh, that they broke, it broke his neck, it broke his back. You know, the guy was, was an absolute mess. He died at the scene where his mechanic was thrown from the car and survived, sustaining only several major injuries to his face and uh, to his hip. But the huh. guy driving the Chevy walked away with just a few broken bones. That's, your, that's, that's the thing. Drive a Chevy. Drive a Chevy. All right, so well, they I'm still s- make that Porsche. You, uh, know, you yeah. know what the difference hot, is now between that? that Porsche then and now? What's that? 2,000 pounds. Nice. Einstein, James Dean, Brooklyn's got a winning team. Brooklyn's got a winning team in 1955. I know that one. Brooklyn Dodgers win right. their World Series before they moved to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Pissing off my Uncle Tommy, rest in peace, who then was forced to become a Met fan like so many other New Yorkers. Correct. So they mentioned that, and nothing strikes more to the heart to Billy Joel than that. 1955, right. the Brooklyn Dodgers win a World Series, and then they pack up and move to fucking Los Angeles. So Correct. Einstein, James Dean, Brooklyn's got a winning team. Davy Crockett, Peter Pan, Elvis Presley, Disneyland. Davy Crockett, 1955. He was a frontiersman, soldier, polit- politician, right. congressman, and prolific storyteller. He was known as the king of the wild frontier. Yep. And um, Disney decided to make a TV show based on his life, and it was played by Fess Parker. And the show now gave a visual image to that iconic um, frontiersman. And the show dropped in 55. Yes. The problem with it was that they called it that he well, part of his costume was a coonskin hat. Right, Kunski and Cap, Which was yeah. deemed offensive by the African Americans, which I get. Oh, yep. And this caught Disney way off guard. They weren't expecting that. I guess they hadn't seen much controversy, and they mm-hmm. lost much of the market share to independent cap manufacturers. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Peter Pan. Peter Pan, um, that was, that was um, it was featured in a Disney animated feature, and it was also the subject of a, a stage musical. And it was when they used a female, Mary Martin, as right, Peter right, Pan. Right, yep. They used And then they filmed it, and they put it out on tapes like you could actually go and watch the film of a broadway show in a movie theater which was big then you have elvis presley signing with rca records on november 21st beginning his pop career going to um go on to become the king of rock and roll which we we did a whole thing on him twisted history of elvis was was very good yeah very good so now davy crockett peter pan elvis presley and finally disneyland disneyland so disneyland opened and it was uh walt disney's first theme park open in 55 Yes, okay. July 17th. Cool. He designed and built everything. Everything was under his supervision, but it was also known as Black Sunday to company insiders, and I'll get to that in a sec. Okay. So construction on Disneyland lasted for exactly one year. It took them 12 months, and it only cost them $17 million to complete, mm-hmm. which would probably make sense when you consider it's when we get to Black Sunday. Um, the opening of Disneyland was only intended for about 11,000 invited guests. Like you had, a, you know, the press came... But about 30,000 showed up with counterfeit tickets. Like, people could not wait to get in. They had celebrities. Ronald Reagan was there. Fess Parker was dressed up as Davy Crockett. But um, the reason it was called Black Sunday was because unbeknownst to Walt Disney and the television and all the audiences, there were tons and tons of problems that you couldn't see. Drinking fountains dried up. Mm-hmm. They didn't have enough water for them. The, nice. foods at the, the food at the restaurant stands, ran out, they ran out of food at them. Rides broke down because, Oof. you know, it only cost them $17 million. Right. I guess there were certain things. And then there was a huge gas leak in Fantasyland, causing half the park to close. Wow. So it was what ultimately was started as a Black Sunday is one of the biggest. Waste of money in, in the world, <laughs> as according to me. All right, so yeah. then that's that the second to last stanza for us. We're going to do one more. But before we do, we're going to take a little break for our final um, ad. And our final ad is by another very important sponsor for us, and it's BetterHelp. People always seem to know when they have a bad foot, when they have a bad knee, when they take care of stuff. Like, you know me, John. I haven't spoke to John yet in this thing. John was traveling with me as I was falling apart in San Antonio. Literally, pieces were coming off. I was just going to say, this is what you need next. (laughs) Right. It's true. 100% true. Right. So people tend to take care of their physicals more than they take care of their mentals. I'm the opposite way for some reason. That's why... I I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm like a box of eggshells. But so particularly with stress, like stress manifests itself physically, but also, you know, there's an easy way, not an easy way, but there's a, a good way to kind of tackle it. And it's with therapy. Therapy has no stigma anymore. And so the people at BetterHelp have decided to give us all a personal experience um, that's easily approached and affordable. 
It's customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions, sessions with your therapist. Live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, so give it a try. If you feel like shit, you go to a doctor. If you're feeling like shit emotionally, sometimes you don't. That doesn't have to be the case anymore. Go to BetterHelp. Go to BetterHelp.com. B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash twisted. And our listeners will get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash twisted. Right? That's what they want to do with us in Twisted History. And I highly recommend you talking to somebody. Right? And not somebody in your family. Not somebody that you know. Not somebody where there can be some sort of, I don't know, like sometimes you don't want to tell people you know everything. When you're dealing with a stranger, a licensed professional, sometimes you can get shit off your chest that you wouldn't normally get off your chest to somebody that you even love. As much as your wife or your husband or something like that, sometimes it just helps to talk to somebody else. So betterhelp.com slash twisted and get 10% off your first month. All righty? Take care of yourself. So we can't do all 118. So we're going to go to this last one. This is this is the last one. It's Bardo Budapest, Alabama, Khrushchev, Princess Great, Pace and Place, Trouble in the Suez. Bardo Budapest, Alabama, Khrushchev, Princess Grace, Peyton Place, Trouble in the Suez. This is all 1956. All 1956. Bardo. That's Brigitte Bardo. You she had was, fun with her. She's gorgeous. You enjoyed that. Bridget you might have stayed Bardo. on that page a little longer. She, than <laughs> you know what? You know, like, you know that they don't, outside of you, they don't make them like Bridget Bardo anymore. I know. It's right? a terrible thing. She's one of the best known sex symbols of the late 1950s and 60s. She stars in God Created Woman in 1956, the year that's at hand right now. And that film establishes her with an international reputation as a French sex kitten. They didn't use that term before Bridget, uh, Bridget Bardo. She's a sex kitten. Bob Dylan dedicated his first song he ever wrote to Bridget Bardot. She was idolized by a young John Lennon and Paul McCartney. You know, there's a rumor that Marlon Brando had a thing with Bob Dylan. Yes. Just saying. Yeah. She starred in over 40 films, but she quit acting in 1973. She quit it cold in 1973. So she made, she made her bones in 56 with End God Created Women, did 40 films, quit acting in 1973. In 1974, the following the following year, she appeared nude in a photo shoot for Playboy magazine again. She'd done it beforehand, which celebrated her 40th birthday. So she walked away from Hollywood before she turned 40. She's still alive. She's 87 years old. She looks terrible. And in recent years, Bridget Bardot has become a controversial figure, having been fined five times. She's been fined for this for inciting racial hatred when she criticized immigration and Islam in France. She doesn't like Muslims. She's also a huge proponent for animal uh, against animal cruelty. She's like mm -hmm. a PETA person. Right. So sometimes the slaughtering of lambs and stuff like that in the Islamic culture rubs her the wrong way. Gotcha. And then it's she brings it to the next level, a la Marlon Brando with the anti-Semitism. So beautiful woman, made her bones in 1956, still alive, hates Muslims. I might right. post for Playboy for my 40th. Let's go. Let's fucking go <laughs> 10 years from now. Bardo Budapest. Budapest. Some call it Budapest. John could be there. Who knows? John just got back from Budapest. It was the site of the Hungarian Revolution, which began on October 23rd, 1956 in Budapest. Thousands of protesters took to the streets demanding a more democratic political system and freedom from the Soviet oppression. Does this sound familiar? Kind of does, right? Because of what's going on in Ukraine. The difference is, and Annie alluded to this when she was talking about the communist bloc, 12 days into the Hungarian Revolution on November 4th, so October 23rd, you start the revolution. Mm -hmm. November 4th, Nikita Khrushchev orders the Soviet tanks to roll into Budapest and it crushed the national uprising. An estimated 2,500 Hungarians died and another 200,000 more fled as refugees. That was Nikita Khrushchev, the guy who tried to transition away from Stalinism. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, Bardo, Budapest, Alabama, Khrushchev. I'm going to do Khrushchev again, by the way. Alabama in 1956. Alabama, they mentioned. Alabama in 1956 was not a great place to be a black dude. But it was also the site of the Montgomery bus boycott. And that's what he's talking about here. One of the pivotal events in the civil rights movement. The campaign actually began in December of 1955. 
right? So just before 56. But the Monday after Rosa Parks was arrested for her refusal to surrender her seat to a white person, this is when the Montgomery bus boycott started, and it continued right through December of 1956. So it lasted almost a year when the federal ruling Browder versus Gale took effect and led to a United States Supreme Court decision that declared the Alabama and Montgomery laws that segregated buses were unconstitutional. That's why Joel mentions Alabama in and along the lines of 1956. I won't let this go because I mention it every fucking time. God bless... um, Rosa Parks, Mm -hmm. but she was not the first woman to refuse to give up her seat on a Montgomery bus. She just looked the part. Claudette Colvin is the real Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. In March of 1955, she was 15, and Claudette refused to move to the back of the bus and give up her seat to a white person. This happened nine months before Rosa Parks did the very same thing. And there were even other brave black women before that who were arrested for similar stunts like Irene Morgan in Virginia in 1944. But I won't even use them, right? Colvin and her circumstances were so similar to Parks, especially since they took place in the same year and they both took place in the same town in Montgomery, Alabama. So why didn't Claudette Colvin get that same star treatment? For all intents and purposes. Why isn't she so historically venerated? Well, it's because Claudette wasn't as marketable as Rosa Parks. She was only 15 and she already had a child out of wedlock. She was molested as a teen. So she had a child out of wedlock. That's not a good image, I guess. She was also darker skinned than Rosa Parks. Sets off another racist flair. Not ideal for photo ops. But it was Miss Colvin's defiant stance on a bus that inspired Rosa Parks to do the same, so we're going to give her the shine that she deserves here. Claudette Colvin was the original Rosa Parks in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama. But we mentioned Alabama in 1956 with the Montgomery bus bus boycott, which brought about the Supreme Court ruling, which made segregating buses unconstitutional. So that's why Billy Joel had mentioned it, and all of a sudden I'm getting myself into a fucking lather over Claudette Colvin. What else do we have? Bardo Budapest, Alabama, Khrushchev. I mentioned him a little bit. Nikita Khrushchev, right? This is a little out of order chronologically because in February of 1956, before the Budapest, before the Hungarian Revolution, Khrushchev made his famous secret speech denouncing Stalin's cult of personality. People know the word cult of personality from the Living Color song, Mm -hmm. right? That's a Khrushchev line. He did it in his his secret speech saying we want to get away from the cult of personality that was established by Stalin. Mm -hmm. We want to get back to Leninist ties. He wants to get out of that inner circle. He he used it to his advantage and then he... But that de-Stalinization speech also loosened the reins in places like Hungary and Poland, Mm -hmm. which caused them to have revolts. And then as soon as those revolts happened, fucking he brought in the tanks. So it wasn't that much different. So that's Khrushchev. And then he mentions uh, Princess Grace, Peyton Place, Trouble in the Suez. So those are our last three. Right. Princess Grace, Peyton Place, Trouble in the Suez. Princess Grace. Another absolute stunner. Irish American, yeah, by the favorite. way. Actress Grace Kelly. That's who Princess Grace was. She appears in her last film that year. The film was called High Society. When you say she appeared in High Society in 1956, people think that she was, you know, buck naked in the fucking magazine. <laughs> it, was, it was a movie called High Society in 1956. And don't talk about Princess Grace like that. So Grace Kelly appears in 1956. She won two Oscars in her very small career. She retired from acting at only 27 years old. Why would someone with two Oscars retire from acting? I'll tell you why. On a photo shoot, she met uh, Prince Rainier of Monaco, and she wound up marrying him. Before that, she banged Clark Gable, and she was proposed to by Bing Crosby, right? I mean, the, whatever. That must have been a smooth proposal, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so she leaves. So, whatever. So she leaves Hollywood. She gets married uh, to the Prince of Monaco, and she quits everything. And it's ultimately it's tragic because she was only 52 when she suffered a small stroke behind the wheel and she drove off a fucking cliff. That's how she died. But here's two small tidbits about Princess Grace. Her father won three gold medals in the Olympics for rowing. That's cool. Yeah, Jack Kelly, her father, Grace Kelly's father, Jack Kelly, is the only rower in the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame. Wow. It's pretty cool. And her mom, Margaret, was the Ivy League's uh, first ever women's sports coach. 
after she organized really? a basketball squad at UPenn. So she came from, and her dad also made millions uh, as a brick uh, developer, devel- uh, building, um, creating bricks and selling bricks to construction sites. So her dad came for money. So much so that when she married Princess, I'm going off script again. When she married Princess Rainier, Prince? he, Prince rather, <laughs> the father of Grace Kelly, the Olympic rower, had to pay a dowry of $2 million. Really? Yeah, had to pay two fucking million dollars for her to marry uh, the prince. Wow. And then one more uh, tidbit. My dad loved her. I know. Yeah. So my dad, I mentioned, you know, my dad's my fucking hero. So my, and my dad and he my mom. He talks about it all yeah, the time. My it's dad and my sweet. mom have a love affair that makes ours look fucking childish. But my dad speaks about Grace Kelly. I don't, I, I don't know. He just loves Grace Kelly. So look up Grace Kelly. She's a beautiful woman and she became Princess Grace and she was in high society in 1956. That's why she's mentioned here. So Princess Grace, Peyton Place, Trouble in the Suez. Peyton mm-hmm. Place was a best-selling, socially scandalous novel by Grace Metallius. It's published in 1956. They sold 60,000 copies within the first 10 days, and it remained on the New York Times bestseller list for 59 weeks. It had a franchise that lasted four decades. It was a movie in 57. They wrote a follow-up novel, Return to Peyton Place, that was made into a film also. It was adapted again in 64. It was a television series. And then the term Peyton Place entered our lexicon describing any small town that holds scandalous secrets. Ooh, that place mm-hmm. is a Peyton That's Place. That's Desperate Housewives. Was, yeah, yeah. So Peyton Place was, again, it. like a mm-hmm. cultural happening. Like a Desperate Housewives thing. Right. Or Beverly Hills 90210. Mm-hmm. That type of shit. <clears throat> That's what Peyton Place had become. And then finally, trouble in the Suez. Growing up in Brooklyn... People who sang this fucking song thought it was trouble in the sewers since we don't fucking pronounce our R's. So it was always like, yeah, I was having a coffee by the sewer. So there was trouble in the sewers. But it's trouble in the fucking Suez, right? That's just what it is. So the Suez Suez Canal, man-made canal. It's 120 miles long. It connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean Mm -hmm. by way of the Red Sea, allowing goods to be shipped from Europe to Asia more directly. Mm -hmm. It is... Very important. And you had mentioned Abdel Nasser, Gamal right. Abdel Nasser, on October 29th, 1956, yep. the year that we're here, the Israeli armed forces pushed into Egypt toward the Suez Canal after the Egyptian president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, mm-hmm. nationalized the canal. No yes. bueno, and people had a big problem with it. So there was trouble in and around, not the sewers of New York. It wasn't like the rats <laughs> were coming up through toilets or the fucking alligators. Trouble in the Suez Canal. And that's... When it goes back to, we didn't start the fire. So there's your chorus right there. We're stopping. So there's 118 references. We just did 55 of them. So we're not even halfway, but that's the way that the song kind of goes into the thing. We're stopping right there. And the other half, which is starting in the 1950s, you know, late 1950s, is going to be next week. I believe Kate is writing a song about it right now. I believe Kate hit me on a thing saying I think I'm going to write a song about recent stuff for We Didn't Start the Is Fire. Is she going to sit right between us? And I have no fucking clue. So we're <laughs> going to we're so. going to be a packed house again next year, next week. We'll have Vibs back. We'll have Annie back. We might have Kate in here singing and obviously Johnny doing his thing. <laughs> so tune in for part two of We Didn't Start the Fire next week on Twisted History. Annie, thank you for obviously My doing pleasure. research and obviously doing the co-hosting thing. John, you know I can't thank you enough. You're the most handsome guy in Ball, um, Barstool. <laughs> and, uh, and that's it. Oh, the Hungry Stuff drops this week. Turkey stuff drops this week. I can't keep up. Turkey with you. in Iraq. Uh, yeah, we're gonna drop the trailer tonight, oh, and excellent. then camel wrestling next week, uh, and hopefully stay on schedule. So we'll update people. We'll drop prog- podcasts, the clips. Were fantastic. I lots can't of wait clips. To see yeah, lots of trailers. Lots of lots of stuff. So. Yeah, oh, and then we're on the road for a couple of weeks doing some boxing stuff. But then when we get back, if we can get Donnie back stateside by that time, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned Kate because she had talked to me about her ex, and maybe we were going to talk about that as well. So right, right, yep, yeah, should be great stuff. Alrighty, so again, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, John. I, I meant sweetheart Andy, not John. And then uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week on uh, Twisted History.